friends, it's, uh, it's John here with Elusive Productions, and this is our seventh video in the series uh, talking about the seven big lessons we learned while staging the rights of Eleusis over the 20 years that we staged and produced them. Um, this one's a little different because it's not so much a lesson as just a part of the process from the beginning, but I really like talking about it. Uh, it comes down to musical themes as they're associated with characters. And I talked a little bit about it when we were talking about character development, but this time I want to deep dive a little more into sort of how we set the themes, uh, what it is that we were trying to accomplish, how it all came about, and then close with uh, one of my favorite pieces of music from The Ride of Saturn. So to start with, uh, we staged The Ride of Jupiter in 2000. And the Rite of Jupiter was a lot of fun, and a lot of the music in, from that initial staging was, was reimagined in 2016 when we staged the Rite of Jupiter again. And as such, there are themes in the Rite of Jupiter that you will find in the Rite of Luna, the first of the videos that we actually produced and that you can go out and actually watch a video presentation of. And that it all sort of tied into this idea that there were going to be musical themes associated with the various characters and the various concepts that we were trying to capture. Now the most notable is probably the rituals. Uh, the pentagram ritual, the hexagram ritual, uh, the star sapphire ritual that appears in the Rite of Luna. And those are informed very heavily by some notes that were initially in Alan Bennett's Golden Dawn diaries that were then more uh, made more public they, uh, they show up as a footnote in, I want to say, The Middle Pillar by Israel Rigardi. And then they also show up in Paul Foster Case's work with the builders of the Aditum, although they are at that point uh, not credited to Alan Bennett, but just to ancient wisdom. Uh, at any rate, they are a series of tonal correspondences that map to the uh, color correspondences that are associated with the Hebrew letters uh, via the tarot keys. So there's basically just a one-to-one -one attribution. The color yellow corresponds uh, to the E natural tone, that sort of thing. Uh, so with that in mind, when we were writing the music for rituals that specifically included Hebrew words or the analysis of Hebrew words, for example, uh, the pentagram ritual or the hexagram ritual, we used those tones in the compositional process. So when you hear the tones being sung, those are ostensibly the tones that correspond to those letters in those names. Additionally, the usually the cantus firmus of the music is built around an analysis of some of the god names associated with those rituals. And so there's just a lot of thought that goes into it. And while we recorded different versions, of those rituals for each of the rites, the tones stay relatively consistent. So, you know, there's a sort of a dreamy sense to uh, the Rite of Luna. Uh, the Rite of Mars also has the pentagram ritual, as does Luna with its sort of dreamy interpretation. And the Rite of Mars is a much more militaristic interpretation. And then you go to the Rite of Saturn, where you have uh, this almost uh, rustic feel to it because again it's it's sort of the beginning of the rites and so we wanted to capture something um, sort of coarse and and colloquial. Uh, at any rate that's that's one of the things that went into the thought process and that also had uh, a lot of influence on key signatures that we chose for specific songs and the ways in which we wrote transitions. As I was saying about the Rite of Jupiter, we had uh, some themes in Jupiter, particularly associated with Hermanibus, that also show up in the Rite of Luna, and at the opening of the Rite of Mercury, and at various points in the Rite of Venus, and Mars, and Jupiter, and Saturn. We have these, and Sol, let's just, all seven, really, let's be real. The idea is that these themes represent characterizations, shifts in consciousness, um, basically the place where where the change is happening. If you hear a theme associated with one figure 
and then you hear it again in another rite, you can see that there's a, an analog between those figures. And it's, it's pretty consistent. Um, and part of how this came about, when we were doing the rite of Luna, we were informed by that earlier rite of Jupiter. Well, uh, Katie Cachet, who performed the role of Luna in the rite of Luna, performed a piece of music at the end. And we had originally talked about having her perform the Bach piece and then she looked at it and said, I would have to practice four hours a day for the next six months to do this piece. Let's do something different. And so she went to some more traditional pieces of Irish folk music. And one of the things that, that she adapted, uh, I really liked the tune. Uh, one of the first things she played was a tune that I was like, oh, that's really cool. So I did a variation on that tune that became associated with the figure of Saturn. I got this idea that if we were gonna, if, if Luna is the end of the cycle and Saturn represents the beginning, what if that thing that she's playing corresponds to Saturn? So you hear snippets of that in the rite of Venus when the character of Saturn is walking on and off stage and taking, uh, actually taking people off stage with him. Uh, so there's this, this theme associated with Saturn that then also shows up in the introduction to the rite of Mercury. And this theme, again, plays out all the way back to when you listen to the overture for the rite of Saturn. It is a variation on that same theme that's played at the very end of the rite of Luna, again, closing that circle. Uh, you'll find the same thing throughout all of the rites. Uh, there are the 963s, which have these, these cool uh, thematic elements. And of course, they're, they're built on J.F.C. Fuller's huge, overblown, ostentatious verbiage, and so we had to write music that sort of captured all the, the syllables that he was including. And the net result was you had these complex pieces of music that called for a very interestingly structured cadence to capture that, uh, that broken up language. So when we were doing Jupiter, uh, Sonny Larson we, we decided that the various themes that the Sphinx was going to play were going to be based on these 963s. And so we called back to the music of the 963s from other rites, and Sonny Larson played these beautiful themes over the top of them, and she composed those based on uh, some of the vocal stuff that was going on earlier. So again, you hear these themes all throughout, and they all sort of reference each other. Uh, I like this because, again, when we're looking at um, Jupiter, in a sense, you've got representations, you know, Saturn is the above the abyss. Jupiter has representations of the god forms after a fashion in all of the other rites, depending on how you count it. So then, again, what we come to is we've got this, this thematic sense traveling through all the rites that we really uh, tried to explore and expand on and make part of our presentation because ultimately we knew we were doing this over a long stretch of time. We had the time to do it, but it also created a, a sense of connectivity to the entire project, a, a sense of, of unison. And uh, there's another callback to the rite of Luna at the end of the rite of Saturn, and that's something that I, I, I wanted to, to draw your attention to in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, City of Dreadful Night is Saturn's sort of soliloquy as he is about to shuffle loose this mortal coil. And uh, the chord progressions for half of that piece of music are the same chord progressions in Priestess of Panormita from the Rite of Luna, slowed down and played with a slightly different rhythm pattern. But it's that same sort of angry transitional space. Uh, this time, you know, in the Rite of Luna, it's very outward. Uh, uh, Pan is expressing frustration with a situation, whereas in the rite of Saturn, it's internal, and Saturn is representing that sort of frustration with feeling trapped in the flesh. Now, the next section of that then uh, creates a chord progression that goes from E natural to A sharp, and that is a really odd transition in terms of music. Uh, it's basically E, then the octave, then the A sharp. And it switches time signature, so it goes from a 4-4 four, four time to a 3-4 time. That 3-4 time 
uh, E natural to A sharp transition then becomes the cantus firmus for the closing piece of music for the rite of Saturn. And again, it's got a certain amount of originality of concept, that, but it also ties in with this thread that goes all the way through. And so when it came time to write the viola solo for that, rather than rely on something that was tied into something that we'd done in any of the other rites, it was like, okay, here's a really great place to introduce this more original concept, this more thing that is just Saturn. And uh, I remember very specifically when Sonny Larson came over to record that viola part. And I was here in this room and uh, she, we, we plugged in all the stuff and we'd done a couple of the other viola parts in the right and already recorded them. And it, this was like, she's like, I know the chords and I have an idea kind of, but I haven't really played with this very much. And we plugged it in and we hit record and one take just played through. The very first take she did, we were weeping by the end of it. It was so beautiful, it was so well done. And we ended up doing a couple more takes and then going, no, the first one, the first one's the one we want. And then she had to go back and learn it and transpose it and it became the solo that she plays at the end of uh, the Rite of Saturn, which we call Pieta, based on the, the pose. Uh, of Mater Coeli and the Magister Templi at the end of Saturn, and that's the clip I'm going to play for you right now. This is the end of number seven of our seven lessons that we learned through producing the rites of Eleusis. And I hope you had a good time playing along with us. It was, uh, it was great fun to, to make these for you and to talk about our process a little bit. Uh, Y'all stay safe and we'll talk to you soon.